I'm not sure if it's a misconception, but what I think that most people underappreciate or maybe don't realize is the irreversibility of it. Many crises that we're in now, you know, housing crisis, economic crisis, recession, etc. Most of them are at least to some extent reversible. I mean, with, with the right policy, we, we could fix them, but this one we can't. Welcome everybody to the 45th episode of the Struggling Scientist podcast. We are a podcast by scientists, for scientists, anyone science adjacent and perhaps even hobbyists. My name is Susanna and I'm here with my co-host Jerome. Hi. So today we have a very interesting episode. It's a Christmas special and we're going to talk about climate change. Not only is climate change of course a super important topic, but we also think it's really important for scientists to stand up for their science. Now, there are actually only very few scientists who have decided to go stand on the barricades to change things. But today we're talking with one. We're going to talk with a guest, Ernst Jan Kuiper, former scientist, current climate change activist and working at an environmental protection organization. This is going to be a very interesting episode that might even inspire some New Year's resolutions. So let's start. Welcome, Ernst Jan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We're very excited to have you here today. And we've got a lot of questions for you. Everything from, of course, climate change to you getting arrested for protesting. But before all of that, we would like to ask you if you want to introduce a little bit about yourself. Where do you come from? What do you do right now? Any interesting hobbies? Um, Well, as you said, my name is Ernst Kuiper, but please just call me Ernst. And I'm from the Netherlands. I live in Amersfoort, but I've spent the last, I think, 12 or 13 years in Utrecht, uh, which is where I studied both my bachelor, my master and my PhD. And my bachelor was in earth sciences and I liked it, but I was not, well, I liked it, but not enough, I guess. So after I finished my bachelor, I switched to, to a master in climate physics, uh, which I actually love. So when I finished that about two and a half years later, I think, uh, I decided to apply for PhD position and I got one where I studied ice dynamics in the Greenland ice sheet. So basically how the ice itself moves from A to B on the ice sheet or in the ice sheet, I should say. And, uh, yeah, I finished that in, uh, in the beginning of 2019. And then I decided to, uh, become a full-time activist, climate activist for almost a year. And after a year, I, well, it was time to, to get back to, uh, to work, I guess. <laughs> uh, so I worked for an NGO called Banktrack for two years. And now since about half a year, I'm working for the, the Dutch branch of Friends of the Earth. It's called Milieu Defensi, Environmental Defense, I guess you translate it, <laughs> where I'm part of the team that is suing the Dutch oil major or the former Dutch oil major Shell. So that's, and you asked me about hobbies. I just <laughs> remember the thing I like most is recycling. Uh, in oh. that sense, I'm very Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> I I actually also play football uh, about twice a week, but I, I like recycling the most. It's Mostly in summer, Dutch. by the way. But, uh, mm, sorry? I think it's both very Dutch. And it's indeed not yeah, the best yeah, weather for it right now, no. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, you briefly brought up your PhD uh, degree and that you studied the, the ice sheet. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your PhD experience? What was it like? Uh, what were the best and worst parts of it? Uh, well, I, th- I think the worst part, I think f- for most PhDs, that's writing the thesis. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so for me, uh, uh, I think, uh, I don't even remember, but I think it's about eight or nine or 10 months mm-hmm. uh, of more or less full-time writing. So that was, for me, at least the worst part. And yeah, the best part, that's also quite easy. It was my or our um, expedition to the Greenland Ice Sheet in the summer of 2018. That was by far the best experience. But also generally, I, I like doing science. So the first couple of years were, were actually great. And then the last half a year to a year was, uh, was, was quite tough, I guess. But We know that feeling, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, th- I think you're, you're also, both of you are quite like... We're writing, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yes, thanks, <laughs> thanks, yeah. I actually had a follow-up question because you said you went into the summer to the, to the ice sheet. Is it possible to visit them in the winter or is it the weather is too bad by, at that point as well? Uh, uh, well, I think the I think the season or at least the trailing season is, or the field season, whatever you call it, it, I think it starts at the end of April. Mm. 
and then they continue until September-ish, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but yeah, they don't go there winter for the simple reason that it's too, it's, yeah, it's, it's simply too cold. Mm -hmm. I, I think you, you go to minus 40s, <laughs> something like that. That's uh, plus, there's, plus there's simply no sunlight, mm -hmm. like yeah. absolutely zero. So that's not a very productive working <laughs> environment, I guess. Uh, but even some of my colleagues who, who started in April, it was still, I think, about minus 35, I think, was the worst it got. So that's, that's, that's pretty tough as well. Mm. Yeah. I was lucky I was there in August, which is like the, the, um, the height of summer, almost. <laughs> the melting season. <laughs> yeah, the melting season. Yeah, we were actually on the middle of the ice sheet where, where there's not a lot of melt sometimes, but... I think it, it was between minus five and minus 25. Uh, that, that, that's more or less the order of magnitude, at least. Basically, tropical weather is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's cold, but to some extent, your body also gets used mm. to it. I notice after roughly a week mm. uh, and you start eating like 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 crazy uh, and you still lose weight. So, <laughs> you you well, those, those calories have to go somewhere. So, <laughs> I, I guess you will just all burn them to stay warm. But uh, yeah. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds really cool. Uh, now, if I got it correctly, you already started with protesting during your PhD or at least got inspired during your PhD. What what inspired you to do this and how did you get into it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a good question. Um, I, I don't re recall exactly when I started, but I, I think it was somewhere halfway my PhD or at least um, maybe in the first part. And the reason why I started, because you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's quite simple. The more you learn about climate change, the more worried you become. Uh, and the more, the more worried you become, the more this, you know, this inner voice starts telling you that you have to do something uh, more than just voting for green parties and, and, and you know, uh, skip meat every now and then. So, but I started with like the, with like the, the the type of activism where you sign petitions and you 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 know you write opinion articles and and that kind of stuff and then yeah after a few years i got between brackets ra radicalized i guess uh, and i decided to to do the kinds of action that that you well, that you already mentioned um so you also ended up joining uh, extinction rebellion and we know you even got arrested during some of these protests so what was it like to join these kinds of protests and what was it like, I guess, to get arrested from that? Uh, yeah, um, how, how was it to, to join? Well, I, I decided to join them when I was actually on the Greenland Ice Sheet. Mm -hmm. um, we were there on field work, or at least I was there for just over six weeks. Uh, and the sun doesn't set at night. So, yeah, you, I was lying in my tent quite a lot, just, just you know, thinking and, and you know, thinking about life and that's plus i was surrounded by other climate science scientists who were just about as alarmed as as i was or i still am actually so that's that's the moment i decided that i needed when i came back i i, I decided that i needed to do more than the things i i already did and more or less by coincidence at the same time extinction rebellion was was founded in the first in the uk and and few months later in the Netherlands. So um, I decided just to join them. I sent them an email and I said, you know, hey, uh, can I join you? And uh, and that's how the whole thing started. And then a few months later, I, I joined the first, well, the first action where, where I got arrested, which was, I think, in April 20, 2020, that is, I think. Is that correct? Yeah, 2020. Uh, so about two, two and a half years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so you also ask how it was to get arrested? Or, mm. Yeah. Or, right. What was that experience like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the first time was, uh, it was quite stressful. I'm, I'm not going to mm. lie about that, which I guess is quite normal or at least. So the first time the police, the police starts, you know, pulling your arm and trying to drag your way and you're passively resisting. Uh, I mean, you're not fighting back is that that will get you into, into legal trouble, but it's, it's, yeah, you know, you, you're fighting all your instincts, which is hard, but, but Extinction Rebellion also trains the activists, or at least they advise you to, mm. to follow Trey. And then actually I was locked up with uh, my other activists in the same chill cell or in the same cell for 
I think for a few hours and I actually had quite a good time. <laughs> um, so I thought, okay, well, this is it, you know, it's not, it's not that bad. And then the time after that, I was locked up on my own for about 11 hours, I guess. Mm. Uh, and that was oh. a bit harder. <laughs> yes. But yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've done this um, many times now, but at this point, I, uh, my heart rate doesn't get above, I guess, about 80 or, or mm -hmm. something like that. It, it, I know exactly what they're going to do. I know exactly what I need to say. I know exactly when they're going to be, when I'm going to be released, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I also, we also know the legal cons consequences because um, we have legal advisors who, who advise us both before and after these kinds of actions. Um, so the more you do it, the more, yeah, you should get to it, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, and would you say that, so in your case, the first time that you got arrested, that you had the training already to know what to expect, I guess, uh, was yeah. it a lot of training or was, was it enough for you that you felt comfortable, like, or at least, uh, not as nervous going into the jail cell, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, th I think the training takes about two or three or four hours mm -hmm. or like, like an afternoon or, or the better part of a day. And they both try to simulate how, what the police is most likely to do, which is, you know, trying to drag you away. And then they teach you that you can either, you, you know, go operate or you can resist, yeah, what we call resisting passively, where, where you're just trying to behave like a sack of potatoes. That's, that's <laughs> basically what you're doing. But they also explain all the legal parts and, and, and how long they can detain you, et cetera. So that gives you quite a lot of, confidence i'm not sure if that's the right word but a lot of trust and and yeah at least that helped me quite a lot and we we advise everyone to uh who's doing this for the first time to to follow such a train mm -hmm. and you also get legal uh help afterwards so mm -hmm. that that's also nice. quite nice um i was just i was just going going to at, at this point in time there i have had zero consequences of all these actions so far i got one fine which we've by the we which we appealed mm -hmm. and that's about it so that's also mostly or thanks to the legal team and why are these type of actions chosen why 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 do you think this type of protesting is the most helpful well because we've tried everything else uh, <laughs> we tried signing petitions we tried uh legal climate marches we tried uh you know voting for green parties we tried to ask the people in power, uh, you know, to, to listen to the science and they simply don't, and they haven't done it for 30 years because, because at, at least since the 1990s, we've known about this stuff. We've, we've had international agreements, uh, international negotiations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's at least 30 years of knowing about this stuff and not, well, either not doing, either doing nothing at all or doing way too little. So at a certain point, you just have to ask yourself, you know, what's the next step? And that's, I think, and I think most people would agree, um, what we call nonviolent civil disobedience. So deliberately uh, breaking the law in a nonviolent way to make a point and hope that the media will pay attention and write about it. And that way, trying to start conversation or public discussion. And I'm no social scientist, but they say, the social scientists say that this uh, historically has been the most effective tactic and that actually caused societal change. So, well, I'm not a social scientist, so um, I guess they're right. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 they, and then you have to think about movements like the suffragettes, like the LGBTQ, uh, et cetera, community. Uh, like uh, Martin Luther King, uh, you know, I mean, the, there are some differences, but, but most of them were non were nonviolent uh, civil disobedience, and at least they managed back then to change society for the good. So why not copy those 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 tactics? Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Are you still doing these type of protests, or how does how does your advocating for for measures to stop climate change look like today? Uh, yeah, I still do. Uh, if it fits my work schedule and personal schedule, et cetera, then I'll, I'll, I'll join these actions. So I, I joined the one at Schiphol, what is it, about a month ago, I guess, uh, which, which made headlines, not just in the Netherlands, but, but um, also abroad. 
and yeah i'll i'll be joining a few more in the in the, in the coming months so they yeah i'm definitely still doing that also because i now i've reached a point where i actually like to to do these accents every now and then uh because i made some friends there and you know it's it's <laughs> kind of cool but yeah i also give talks every now and then about climate change and i write some articles for Dutch news site but but most importantly i work for an ngo that is uh suing yeah as i said is is suing the dutch or the formerly dutch but now uk <laughs> oil major school uh yeah i think they they they, uh, they left for yeah they left for tax reasons i guess but um is it can other scientists also join the fight well easily i guess and get this uh training or is in, i said believe you said in your case you had to email them to see if you could join and so is is it sort of open open to every every scientist who wants to join absolutely absolutely yeah so Please, please join. I mean, now there's even a branch of Extinction Rebellion that's called Scientists Rebellion, which, well, the name already says it. It's a bunch of scientists who decided to to rebel and are using their knowledge of, well, their their research field to to actually get get this message across. And I also joined them not that long ago, actually, in the Netherlands, but I think they have branches in most countries, at least most European countries. And there's also called this group called Scientists for Future, uh, at least in the Netherlands and also in most European countries. They also do activism, but they don't go into the illegal stuff. So mm -hmm. they, they, and that's that's the distinction, I guess, between the two, or at least the most important distinction. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and and just Google them and send them an email or a Twitter or a message or whatever, and and you can easily join. Mm -hmm. nice. Now you mentioned when we talked before that when you joined it was sort of still a bit weird for other scientists that you were doing that do you think that has gotten better or is it more normal to stand up for your science and to yeah definitely it is becoming normal more normal uh although i think still the majority of scientists don't do this kind of stuff uh well the f to be honest the vast majority but at least there's more support for for it i think uh, and more also joined i mean at least in the Netherlands, I was the first climate scientist to to start doing uh, well. At least to to join Extinction Rebellion, and now a whole bunch of them joined. And that that's not just climate scientists, by the way. It's it's from all all kinds of corners uh, from the university. So yeah, there's there's definitely an increasing support and an increasing activism, and well. Of course, I, I I don't know for sure, but I, I think more and more people just start are starting to realize that you know the government is not going to solve this thing, or at least not going to solve it in time, because that's the thing with climate change: the longer you wait, the 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 harder it gets to to avert most dire consequences. And the reason that we're in a climate crisis is because we've waited for so long. So yeah, there's 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 absolutely an an increase in in activism at universities as well. I, th I think uh, by the time we're recording this today, they they occupied the 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 technical university in Eindhoven mm. for about a week. Or I'm not sure if you saw that in the news, but yeah. So they they demanded that the university would would cut its ties with uh, Shell or at least the entire fossil fuel industry, and they decided to at least group of scientists and students decided to to uh, occupy one of the buildings there for just uh, i think about seven days or mm. with something like that i mean uh, just three or four years ago this was unthinkable this kind of mm -hmm. stuff mm. yeah so maybe segueing a little bit more now towards the actual sort of climate research and climate science so, so our audience can also understand why you're doing the things that you're doing. Why are so many people doing the things, things like this? What do you think people need to know about what is happening with climate change sort of right now to have a better sense of the state that we're actually in, that they understand why you're doing these kinds of things? <laughs> uh, yeah, how long do I have? <laughs> um, uh, no, I'll keep it short, uh, or at least I'll try to keep it short. So the... The thing I explained first when I give presentation or talk about this stuff is is explaining the carbon budget. And the carbon budget is is it's in it's quite simple. It's the amount of CO2 that we can still emit before we reach a certain temperature increase. Mm -hmm. So as an example, uh, by now, like the end of 2022, 
The carbon budget for 1.5 degrees is roughly 380 gigatons of CO2. You can't forget about that, that unit. But just to put that in perspective, we emit just over 40 gigatons a year as, as humanity. So by the time we, we have emitted 380 gigatons, we're at 1.5 degrees as a best estimate, which means that you just have to divide 380 by roughly 40, add it to the year uh, 2023, because that's, well, we're almost there. And you realize that roughly by the end of this decade, we're at 1.5 degrees at current emission levels. Uh, so that gives us less than 10 years of current emissions before we are at 1.5 degrees. And if you want to stay within the budget and you then you have to reduce your carbon emissions or your carbon dioxide emissions each year, that makes kind of sense, I guess. Mm -hmm. And if you just do some simple arithmetic and just see, you know, how much you have to reduce your emissions each year to stay within this uh, 380 gigatons, we're talking about almost 11% of CO2 reduction per year. So year on year, we have to reduce our emissions 11% a year. That is insane. Because just to give you some comparison, the, the 20, in the year 2020, with all the corona lockdowns and, and all that kind of stuff, global CO2 emissions were reduced by, I think, about 6%. Oh. Uh, that gives you some idea about the order of magnitude we're talking about. and. The thing with a budget is that each year you do not make it or you 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 don't get to the, in this case, minus 11%. The next year, this number goes up mm. because you've eaten away a bunch of the carbon budget again. So you have less years to, to, to stay within the budget. So your reduction percentage gets higher. So that gives you some, some kind of idea what it will take to stay within 1.5 degrees or, or at least to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. So that's part one. Uh, and then part two, just to get some idea of the impacts of 1.5 degrees. And then I'm going to talk about a paper, a science paper from, I think, about August or September this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was about climate tipping points. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the climate system until a certain point, it reacts more or less linearly to our emissions, which basically means that the temperature increase is linearly dependent on the cumulative emissions. So the total emissions since like pre-industrial age. But then at a certain point, you might get into some kind of tipping points in the climate system. And this paper was about tipping points. And they researched, I think it was about 15 or 18 uh, known tipping points in the climate system. Mm -hmm. um, and they tried to estimate where the temperature was that the tipping point would be triggered. So the Earth warms by a certain amount. And then at, at a certain point, one of these tipping points, you know, it, it's triggered. Uh, and then you have to think about the, the death of the coral uh, reefs, the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet and the, the Greenland ice sheet. And well, a, a long story short, they identified, I think about 15 or 18 global climate tipping points. And they estimated for five of them that uh, the that, uh, threshold temperature would be 1.5 degrees. Mm -hmm. Three of them being uh, the coral reefs, uh, the, the collapse of the brilliant ice sheet and the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Mm -hmm. There is quite some uncertainty in there, but the best estimate temperature tipping point was 1.5 degrees. Which basically means that if we go above 1.5 degrees, which is almost inevitable by now, we will likely lose the Greenland and the West Antarctic ice sheet and all the coral reefs. And the more temperature increase we get, the more tip tipping points we pass, or at least the higher the chance that we pass the number of these tipping points. So that was a mini five, maybe 10 minute lecture. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Into at least it gives, I, at least I hope it gives some idea of the urgency of of the of the yeah the the crisis that that we are in um yes i'm I not sure if i explained that correctly or uh, no, no i think it questions. was quite quite clear i think i've also read something about that paper that also the problem is that if if one of the ice sheets does melt that there's also co2 stored underneath it so yeah, that, I, I think that's the permafrost mm, um, yeah. in in like Siberia, Canada, Alaska, those 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 types of regions. Um, and yeah, if if that starts to melt, we get 
either or both CO2 emissions and methane emissions. Um, mm. Methane is even worse than CO2. Uncertainty is very high, but but indeed the there's another tipping point that that I think would be triggered at 1.5 degrees or mm. or so. Do you have an idea of like how how many tipping points we've already passed by at this point to sort of have more of an impression of where we're at in the current scale of the tipping points? Uh, so these tipping points they have quite a big uncertainty range, mm. um, and f- at least for the Greenland ice sheet and the Western Arctic ice sheet, we are already in the uncertainty range. I think that starts at a roughly one degree of global warming, mm. and by now we are depending on your definition, but we're at 1.2. So it's the spectrum, you know, and the best estimate or the or the median uh, is at 1.5. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure about the coral reefs. I think we are either in the uncertainty range or, or very close to it. Mm-hmm. But the best estimate is that we haven't tipped, that we haven't passed a tipping point yet, but we could already have, especially for the Western Antarctic ice sheet, which seems to be the most unstable one. Um, but we don't know. Okay. And um, what are some of the common misconceptions that you hear about climate change that you would like to take this opportunity to debunk? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't expect many climate, uh, climate deniers or whatever to listen to this, so I, I, I guess I don't have to take that that road. But what I, I'm not sure if it's a misconception, but what I think that most people underappreciate or maybe don't realize is the irreversibility of it um that i mean on human time skills let's let's talk human time skills and not geological time skills this is basically irreversible i mean in theory we we can suck a whole lot of cco2 out of the atmosphere and and maybe decrease the, the temperature by one or two tenths of a degree but i mean for all practical purposes it's it's irreversible and i think most people just don't intuitively get that because many crises, crises that we're in now, you know, housing crisis, economic crisis, recession, etc. Most of them are at least to some extent reversible. I mean, with, with the right policy, we, we could fix them or at least to a large extent, but this one we can. And I th- probably most people do know this, but they might not, you know, realize it. I, th- I think that's, that's, that's my most important message. Uh, this is irreversible on human time scales, and therefore, in my opinion, together with the loss of biodiversity, by the way, these are the two most important topics that humanity is is facing at the moment. Now, of course, we have, I guess, the the Paris Accords, and that you're probably well familiar with, that are trying to limit the global warming to to max that 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius uh, by putting a limit on the CO2 emissions. I think we've sort of hit on your your opinion on it, but how do you think this is going so far? And was it ever enough in the first place to even should we have been even stricter much sooner with the with that agreement? Agreement. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, if I think the first thing to say about the Paris Climate Agreement is that the the idea that one point five degrees of temperature rise is safe is that's that's a politician. That's decided mm. or uh, by politicians and not by scientists. Mm. I think if you would ask a climate scientists, they would all say, well, basically zero or at least below one degree of, of global warming. But I think by the time that they started to to talk about this, you know, which was basically in the climate negotiations in, in 2009 in Copenhagen, we were already or at least almost at one degree of global warming. So setting a temperature target at one degree of global warming would have been quite ambitious. So they decided to go for two degrees. And then because of activism and and mostly actually the the small island nations and the most vulnerable nations and climate change in the world, they actually lobbied to get at least something mentioned about 1.55 degrees in the Paris Climate Accord. And that's why we we got this fake description of, I'm quoting, uh, pursuing efforts to limit the global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees and keep it well below two degrees. It's it's quite unclear what pursuing efforts and well below two degrees means, but that's 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 the text or that's that's what it says. So and then yeah, and then then all the 
plan scientists confirmed actually what we already knew that that two degrees of global warming is in no way safe so so we should aim for 1.5 degrees uh, at the most by now we are at the end of 2022 paris climate agreement was signed almost seven just over seven years ago, I think it was on the 12th of December, if I remember correctly, or at least in December 2015. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking exactly seven years later, and global emissions are still rising, except for the occasional corona pandemic mm -hmm. or economic crisis or, or, or anything like that. Global emissions have, have been going up ever since. Actually, they have been going up since we first started talking about this stuff in the 1980s mm -hmm. and 1990s. So, I mean, they, they haven't been growing as fast recently as they, as they used to, but they're still go, going up. And as I explained, of, I think about 10 minutes ago, is that, that it, it needs to be in a free fall. It, it, we don't, I mean, by now, just the decline alone is not enough. It needs mm -hmm. to be, the emissions needs to be in a free fall by, as I said, about 10% a year. So is it enough? I mean, the core itself, 1.5 degrees is, is, not good, but I, I guess it's okay. Um, but we're, I mean, when we're not doing enough, I mean, when we're not even close to doing enough. So in, in that sense, no, we're, we're simply, yeah, we're simply failing to, to take this, to take this thing seriously. Um, do you think there are any countries who are doing a good job at curbing their carbon emissions? And, and if so, what are they getting right at others or not? Um, I think no country in the world is actually taking the Paris Accord literally and, and, and doing what it says. Uh, but I think the country that, that comes closest is Finland. By coincidence, I had to read the, the Finnish climate goals for my, for my current job. <laughs> uh, and they actually do take the two parts of the Paris Agreement literally, which is the 1.5 degrees and the carbon budget that goes along with it. And what is often called the CBDR principle, and that their CBDR stands for uh, Common but Differentiated Res Responsibilities, which basically says that the richest countries in the world will do more and will get to, to climate neutrality faster than the what they call developing countries. And that, that has been part of the Paris Agreement and all the agreements since. So it's not just that that. Like from a global perspective, scientists can give you a carbon budget. Uh, you know, we can only emit this much CO2 before we hit this amount of warming. Uh, but then but then politicians have to decide, you know, how to divide the carbon mm. budget, basically. And there, the richest countries in the world have actually promised to do more and to go faster towards zero than the developing countries. And Finland is, at least by my knowledge, the only country that actually has done that. And they have set climate neutrality or, or a net zero goal by 2035, mm -hmm. uh, which is about 15 years earlier than most Western countries. It's probably still not enough, but at least it's in the right order of magnitude. You know, we, we, we can discuss the details, but at least it's, it's in the right order of magnitude somewhere between 2030 and 2035, maybe 2040. So by my knowledge, that's the only country. Mm. But it's definitely, I mean, if we're talking about the big emitters, China, US, European Union, except for Finland in that case, but no one's doing enough. And, and just to give you an order of magnitude idea, so as the world as a whole needs to reduce its carbon emissions by at least 10% a year. The richest countries ha have promised to do more. So then we're talking about close to 15% a year. And most of the richest countries in the world do maybe 1% or 2% a year. That's like the order of magnitude. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it has gotten better. I mean, we're, we're, we're spending more on, on renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's, nowhere, near, it's nowhere near enough, unfortunately. Do you think it all has to come from the governments or do we also have some hope for some of the companies who are really trying to push for? Uh, <laughs> well, 
the company I know most about is Shell. And uh, ah, no, <laughs> um, no, the green sure. companies, the green companies. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Because uh, so, my trust in Shell to solve this is pretty much zero. Uh, green company, yeah, to some extent I do. But what we've seen for the last three, four, five decades is that renewable energy has come on top of fossil fuels and not is not replacing fossil mm -hmm. fuels. So if you, if you look at the globe as a whole, so while the thing we need to do is just now stop burning fossil fuels, that's that's the plus stopping um, deforestation, which is also quite important. But about 80% of emissions is from fossil fuels. And so I, I, I mean, of course, I fully support renewable energy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not denying that. But what we actually need to do is just, you know, scale down the fossil fuel industry at 10% a year and stop deforestation as soon as we can. Those are the only two things that the climate actually cares about. We can build a million windmills, but if we do not shut down oil refineries and, and that kind of stuff, it, the climate won't even notice. So, and, and we need government intervention for that because Shell, because Shell is not going to stop trading oil all by itself. What do you think of this new trend that companies would like sort of use it as a marketing strategy almost to be green? I mean, Tesla has their own whole like company built on the fact that they're trying to change the world, but I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, yeah it's mostly marketing. I mean, yeah. it's, it's um, as I said, I know Shell best and they, they it's, it's quite often it's, it's they, they trust that that non -ex at this moment non-existent technologies will all of a sudden appear in the future and will all be working perfectly, and they're trying to offset quite a bit. So there is a market, a global market, where you can offset your emissions, which is I think most people have some kind of vague idea what this means, but it's in practice it comes down to paying someone in the third world some money to to plant. A, a forest or, yeah. or protect the forest, get some common credits for it, and then claim that that you are carbon neutral while at the same time haven't really changed your your business model. That's, I mean, it's more nuanced than than that sometimes at least, but that's what it basically comes down to. So yeah, and and for some companies it's quite easy to go green, and for some it's not. You know, it's it, uh, so. The more you learn about stuff, the more the more greenwashing you see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yes. Well, that non-existent technology is, of course, also maybe a nice segue to the carbon capture strategies. Do you do you believe in that? Do you think it will help, or do you think it's mostly an excuse to not do anything yet? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, it's a question. I, I again, I could talk about just this question for 45 minutes easily, uh, which I won't, don't worry. But so the thing is that by now, these, these reduction targets that, that, that we have are so radical and are so what is often called economically disruptive that politicians just don't like it and others can't get their model story to work. So at a certain point, I think about 10 years ago or so, they decided to, to add uh, negative emission technologies, which is basically, so at this moment in time, most of our emissions are positive. We emit to the atmosphere, and then at a certain point, we, we breach the carbon budget, and then the idea is we can continue for a while, but then in the second part of this century, so roughly after 2050, we suck carbon out of the atmosphere at an industrial uh, rate, at an industrial scale, I should say. So that's that's and and that's what calls negative emissions. So then you're taking CO two out of the atmosphere. The thing is that by now there are at least some models are predicting or are assuming, I should say, that we're gonna suck hundreds of billions of tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and we don't even have the technologies to do that. At least not not yet. There are some 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 pilot studies take a few million tons out of the atmosphere. So we're talking about millions instead of billions. So that's about three orders of magnitude uh, there. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, but that's, that's, and it's, it's, I mean, we're just relying on technologies that don't even exist yet. 
and we're not even sure if they will work in the future but we are already planning those in and that's just because we're i think we're afraid to to actually face the crisis that we're in you know that we have to to slash our emissions as fast as we can and then yeah and um, and that's just apart from the ethical discussion which there is you know our our grandchildren have to do this and they didn't have a voice they didn't have a, a saying in in this we just demand or we assume that they will get about 10 to 15 gigatons of co2 per year out of the atmosphere that is roughly the same the same amount of emissions that we uh, emit with the coal industry that's that's like the same order of magnitude as i said with technologies that we don't have yet which yeah it's just so unethical it, it, it i mm. i'm struggling at least i'm struggling to find words to describe this kind of stuff and it's it's already there you know we we actually already assumed this yeah so maybe a follow-up question to that is the the 300 plus gigatons that we need to that we have as a budget taking into account then that's a lot of carbon dioxide will get taken out of the air or is that without that so that's without it so at, at this moment the the calm budget is about 380 gigatons so what most of these emission scenarios do is that we uh, from tomorrow onwards we we reduce our uh, emissions by about six percent a year mm -hmm. which is as i said a lot that's roughly this this the same amount as we did in one year during uh, during the corona crisis or at least the first year of the corona crisis but six percent is a lot but it's not 11 percent, which is necessary to stay within the budget uh so then somewhere in the 2030s 40s we we emitted 380 gigatons which is the budget then we go over the budget by three four five six seven hundred gigatons at a certain point somewhere in 20 50 we assume that we have net zero emissions so then uh, we don't add car add co2 to the atmosphere anymore and then the line or the graph goes you know into the negative and then we assume that that this overshoot is what it's called uh is taken out of the atmosphere mm -hmm. and there are many models some have a very limited overshoot a few have no overshoot but most of them have an overshoot that runs into the many hundreds of gigatons of co2 which is more than the budget it, itself at this point <laughs> so uh, yeah so this uh, to answer your question this 380 that's that's just the budget and and then we're talking mm. about the overshoot that needs to be removed from the atmosphere at at some point in the future yeah but the governments are are already calculating for doing that yeah yeah, yeah, and it's completely unclear who is going to do this by the way so it's not just that we don't have the technologies it's it's also unclear who's going to finance it because it's it's quite expensive to to suck carbon out of the atmosphere and the more i read about this the more i i read about papers that say that you well we i mean you basically need either one of the two things to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere one is a lot of renewable energy like lots and lots of it because then you can actually build a machine that sucks co2 out of the atmosphere or you need a lot of land and then you can plant trees and you can burn them and then you can capture the CO2, at least in theory. Uh, and then you can use that same land to grow trees again. That's mm -hmm. that's and that has all kinds of troubles because we won't have a lot of renewable energy in the near future uh, because we can't, you know, burn fossil fuels anymore. So <laughs> and using the land has all kinds of problems with with food production and biodiversity and land grabbing and, and all that kind of stuff. So no government in the world is actually planning to do this on a large scale. No. Now, um, in the very beginning, we also mentioned inspiring New Year's resolutions. Do you have any rec <laughs> recommendations for something that will help? <laughs> Maybe even um, something for scientists. <laughs> something for scientists. Um, yeah, I would ask or may maybe even urge the scientists who are listening and the not scientists, by the way, to maybe think about becoming an activist. And there are all kinds of levels or or ways you can do that. I mean, I, I've decided to join the more radical groups now, or what they call radical groups. But there are many other ways to do that. Uh, you can give talks. You, you can start local coal, uh, renewable energy, um, 
co-operations, et cetera, et cetera. And all of them are fine and all of them are contributing to um to a more just world and uh, and hopefully a, a world that 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 where climate change is is manageable and from a and from a personal perspective i i i often say when i give a talk or when i talk to people at a party or whatever although this is not stuff i talk about <laughs> at parties because it's kind of a party boomer <laughs> um but is is that I don't I honestly don't really care that much about your carbon footprint. So you know, uh, I mean, I I I it's it's good to stop flying. It's good to reduce your meat consumption or become a vegetarian. What's most helpful is to inspire others to 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 care about this topic and to to somehow fight for for societal change. That's that's if, at the end of the day, that's is what can save us, and not skipping meat every now and then and 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 that kind of stuff mm. but everyone has to decide that for him or, her, or herself i think yeah is there anything we did not ask you about that you would still like to get a word in or add to uh not that i can think of at the moment at least. <laughs> good <laughs> yes we did a good job then <laughs> <laughs> and if our listeners want to uh, follow you on social media how can they find you uh yeah i'm i'm active on twitter uh that's and now mastodon i think mm -hmm. it's called no. or i'm not sure if i pronounce it the right way because some billionaire is messing up twitter <laughs> <laughs> although i mean the place was already pretty much messed up anyway but so yeah just just look for my name and i'm i'm pretty sure uh you can find me uh you don't encounter my name that often so it should be easy yes okay well it was really nice to have you as a guest and we learned a lot um, if our listeners have any questions, suggestions, comments, or papers we really need to read, you can reach us via our email, thestrugglingscientist.hotmail.com. You can also check our website, thestrugglingscientist.com, for some really cool science-inspired merch, uh, and to sign up for our awesome Journal of the Struggling Scientist, aka our newsletter. And you can also follow us on social media, of course. You know, which ones are those again? Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and also Mastodon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for listening and we hope to see you all next time. Bye. Bye.